Welcome everyone to Redacted on this Wednesday. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. And on this show, we try to question everything and cover the stories the mainstream media largely ignores. Tonight, we've got a jam-packed show for you. Uh, Kyle Serafin, former FBI whistleblower, is going to be joining us tonight to talk about the disaster that is unfolding right now in Congress over FISA. Uh, Edward Snowden tweeting... Uh, you know, all afternoon, he's been wickedly busy. He's like, I hope ple people please wake up. The NSA, uh, the intelligence community is going to have full control, basically, of the Internet in the United States, and it will give them unbelievable powers to spy on Americans. So we're going to dive deeply into that tonight. Plus, remember when we cared about Ukrainians? I guess we don't anymore because we're allowing them to be drafted in the most draconian ways. Uh, Zelensky has signed into law new draft rules in Ukraine, and it has people all over the world. Those You remember those refugees we said we love so much? I guess we don't stand for them anymore. Well, we still do, and we're going to tell you what's happening to them. We're also going to talk about Canada, which is rolling out right now their budget plans, which will add tens of billions of dollars in debt to Canadians. At the same time, calling upon more Canadians to send more money to Ukraine. So this is not just in the United States, of course, it's in Canada as well. So we'll get to all of that. Plus, we're going to talk some NPR fail today on the show. But good to see everyone. Let us know where you're joining us from around the world. Good to see all of you from uh, you can let us know. I, someone keeps saying RIP Chuck Norris. That Chuck, we get that every night. Everyone says rip, that, that rip Chuck Norris. He's not dead. Every day it's yeah. somebody else. Yeah, Chuck, he's, Chuck but Norris it's always that That's name. not possible. Mila Kunis or Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris can't, I don't know. Yeah, exactly, Philip. Chuck Norris cannot die. Chuck Norris cannot die. So that's not going to happen. He's only 84. So. Yeah. So we are going to uh, get to all of those stories uh, and more in a moment. Uh, but we do have your news roundup we want to get to today on the show. So let's talk about this. Remember when they called us conspiracy theorists for talking about how governments and NGOs carrying out cloud seeding programs or how people have seen an unbelievable explosion of chemtrails? And then we're just conspiracy theorists. Well, we were all proven correct once again. The city of Dubai in the United Arab Emirates is flooding more than six inches of rain falling in a matter of hours and according to bloomberg this is thanks to their cloud seeding program so this look at this this is unbelievable they are not used to this what six inches in just a few short hours they're used to three inches per year so in one 24-hour period actually i think it was 48 uh, they got two years worth of rain i right, look at that mall we were just there yeah. Isn't that crazy? Look and, at that. And, you know, they don't have the infrastructure for drainage. So that's why their highways are stuck. They're flooding all over the place. It's wild there. Yeah. yeah and, I mean, I lived, I lived in Arizona uh, when I was like 20, and it, we had a, a, a rainstorm one day, and it's like one night, and because it's not built for it, it just flooded everything. It was crazy. I couldn't imagine getting that much rain. Like, that's, that's insane. And the cloud seeding program that they've got, so this is legit. This is not a conspiracy theory. Like, oh, no, there's no, they're not seeding clouds. There's nothing about chemtrails. Now, there are two different things, cloud uh, seed, uh, seeding clouds and chemtrails, two different things. One is purportedly supposed to be good, right? The idea that we're going to have rain. The other one is supposed to be bad. It's supposed to stop rain. It's like supposed to stop it, right? That That's chemtrails uh, and cause all sorts of sickness for people and really, really awful. But here is just an insight into UAE's cloud seeding program. Yes, this is real. Just so I know, I have to drive back from Abu Dhabi to Dubai. Uh, no. It's not raining. It's a sunny day. The UAE government invested more than $20 million in research to start a process called cloud seeding. The UAE performs around 1,000 hours of cloud seeding a year, and it's all controlled by this building in the National Center of Meteorology in Abu Dhabi, where they track the whole process. We met with a cloud seeding expert to explain how the seeding process works. We wait for the forecast when we have a good you know, chance for, uh, for cloud. We send the aircraft to that location. It go under the cloud in the first stage of the cloud there is good updraft at that time start to release all the salt and with the good updraft of course it will go inside the cloud uh, the droplets will become bigger and start to uh, rain the center manufactures a salt substance that helps enhance rainfall they put them in what they call flares yeah so that's what you can blame that. And so there, I saw some I saw some people online that are like, "Come on, you right wing nut jobs out there! This is not cloud seeding. This is clearly climate change." And then the UAE 
fires back and actually says, no, yeah, we were cloud seeding. In fact, we confirmed at the Gulf States National Center of Meteorology dispatched seeding planes um, from Al Ain Airport Monday and Tuesday to take advantage of the cloud formations. The seeding planes have flown seven missions over the past two days. <laughs> so, yes, this was directly responsible for all of this. Of course, this isn't the first time, by the way, and it won't be the last back in 2016. One day before the worst floods in Tasmania's in 40 year history uh, in Tasmania and Australia, a cloud seeding plane was launched and brought devastating rain. Look. Residents in southern Tasmania are demanding to know why cloud seeding was conducted over the Derwent River catchment the day before the worst floods in 40 years. Cloud seeding is a technique used to increase rain. Hydro Tasmania has confirmed it flew a cloud seeding flight despite the weather warnings. Farmers believe the technique could have made the flooding worse. Yeah. The Premier says a formal... Yeah, they did make it worse. So, I mean... Maybe we should think about that before we do it again. And in exactly. fact, there was a man we were watching recently on Tucker Carlson who was talking about all these great innovators in California and said, a lot of these guys, they just want to start a cloud seeding business in California and they don't want this book politics and things like that. And I was like, wait a minute. The, yeah, when the, he said that, I was like, hmm. The, the cloud seeding. Uh, seed. I mean, did you know that just... we used this in Vietnam to flood enemy trails as uh, enemy as warfare? Yeah. So this is not a new technology, but yes, yeah, it, it, it can be used. It can go wrong. You can see. Go ahead, Philip. Well, it just this is this is a process that's been kind of balanced on this planet over the course of millions and millions of years, like hundreds of millions of years. And you're going to start messing with that balance. Like, right. I, yeah. That's like absolute hubris, in my opinion. Like that's, yes. that's one of those things I don't I don't like when science gets involved in. Like, no, let's not let's not poke that bear. Yeah. yeah, hubris is the right word. So I just wonder, you know, is anyone going to say, oh, sorry, took it too far, right? Because people can get hurt. We see that uh, in Dubai, the roads shut down, then no one can get to an ambulance. No one can get to a hospital. This, these things have major consequences. We will see something like that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, one more thing we'd like to tell you about. Now, last week we talked about the Boeing whistleblower and we said, hey, Whoever this guy is, when we see his face, we better protect him because the last Boeing whistleblower, things didn't go so well with him. He was found dead in a parking lot during his most explosive testimony. Well, the whistleblower came to Congress today. This is Ed Pearson. He told the Senate, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a criminal cover up. Uh, remember, we talked about it, how he was saying what he said to The New York Times and what he said to the FDA is that different pieces of the fuselage are made in different factories and they don't always come together nicely, as you would expect. So sometimes we kind of got a foursome and those are ticking time bombs. Watch what he said to Congress today. Boeing routinely states that their airplanes meet or exceed all safety standards. This is untrue and misrepresents the safety of the airplanes. The company illegally removed thousands of quality control inspections on individual airplanes without the FAA's knowledge and without the knowledge of the airlines. Although many of these inspections have been reinstated, hundreds of airplanes have left Boeing factories without those thousands of inspections. My last point is the Department of Justice and FBI relied on the slanted results of the first max accident investigation to develop an illegal and unjust deferred prosecution agreement. The NTSB chair reiterated to Congress last week that Boeing has said there are no records documenting the removal of the Alaska Airlines door. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a criminal cover-up. Records do, in fact, exist. I know this because I've personally passed them to the FBI. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to see that, please. Boeing's Ooh. good. Yeah, I, I mean, they stopped conducting thousands of quality control inspections. Hundreds of airplanes left Boeing factories without these inspections. Next time you fly, check to make sure whether or not it's a Boeing flight or not. So that's up to you to fly that or not. Meanwhile, Germany wants to ban cars on the weekends. Yeah, this is a crazy story. German transport minister has come under fire saying that the country may need to implement a ban on driving on weekends. Now, during the summer, because it forms their, because of, unless they pass their controversial Climate Protection Act, unless we pass it, we really think that private car ownership, private car driving on the weekends is a no-no because the climate, I mean, we're, you know, we're under this catastrophic situation right now with the climate. So we need to Which stop means, this. 
You can only drive to work on the weekdays, but no fun on the weekends. Exactly. Why don't you do it Monday and Tuesday? But also, I love the idea that you can't have no private car ownership. So you you can use electric Ubers or something. You could certainly use the infrastructure that they want you to use. But private car ownership, this is the kind of stuff you're going to start to see with digital IDs, your carbon footprint, your carbon passport. Yeah. Um, oh, you can't go through this checkpoint because you've already used up your allotment of carbon. Um, and, you know... And meanwhile, Germany is collapsing right before our eyes. But this is just another example. So no private car ownership in Germany for the weekends. That's, That's coming wild. Uh, we've got more news to get to here in a second. Kyle Serafin, former FBI whistleblower, is going to join us to talk about FISA and Congress um, in just a second. But first, we want to tell you about our friends, our sponsors over at Aura, because right now, if you want to stop spammers and scammers from getting your private information, you know, we're talking about FISA, we're talking about the FBI, we're talking about all of these guys taking your private information, going through your private information, your banking information, your email, all of that, and our friends at Aura can help stop it. If you go to Aura.com slash redacted, they're going to give you a two-week free trial where you can find out more information. And what's great in that two-week free trial, you can go there and you can find out what the internet has about you. Like, have you ever, like, Googled yourself? You know, your private information, your your emails, your bank records, stuff like that that might be out there on the Internet. Well, Aura can help you find that even within that first free two week trial, you can check it out and see what they have on you. So if you're feeling so annoyed by all the constant spam, Aura can actually help you get rid of it. That's what they do. They It's a one stop shop. Um, they don't just put a Band-Aid on the problem. They actually go to the root of the problem, and they force these guys to remove you from their list, these data brokers that steal your information and sell your information. So check them out right now. They also have a whole bunch of other services, a VPN, password management, even identity theft insurance, all of this bundled into one simple affordable package. Check them out today. Go to Aura.com slash Redacted. Try the two-week free trial and just see if it fits for you. I think you'll really impre be impressed by it. Um, again, Aura.com slash Redacted. Well, one way to take away American civil liberties is to claim we are in a civil war. Abraham Lincoln did it, of course. He suspended the writ of habeas corpus during the Civil War, which meant that they couldn't you know, bring prisoners before a judge, would hold them indefinitely, basically holding them against their will um, because you know, we're in a civil war. We can't have them be going in front of a judge or rounding up Japanese Americans, holding them illegally in internment camps during World War II. And yesterday, Democrat, I mean, Republican Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, said he considers himself a wartime Speaker of the House, and that's why he's pushing so hard to spy on Americans. Listen. Um, look, we are, in, we are in unprecedented times, okay? Um, we're in dangerous times, as has been articulated here, around the world, and here at home. We need steady leadership. We need steady hands at the wheel. I, look, I regard myself as a as a wartime speaker. I mean, in a literal sense, we are. I knew that when I took the gavel. I didn't in anticipate that this would be an easy path. Former Speaker Newt Gingrich posted a couple days ago on his social media that um, this is the hardest challenge that's faced a speaker probably in the history of the country, in the moment that we're in right now. Well, he's such a martyr, isn't he? We should all really feel feel badly for him. Now the extension of FISA is before our Congress, which gives broad powers to our intelligence agencies to not only spy on foreign adversaries, but of course also on Americans. Edward Snowden calls it a red alert moment for the United States. And he said, quote, the NSA is just days away from taking over the internet. It's not on the front page of any newspaper because no one has noticed. He said, if you work as a U.S. tech firm, this bill could transform your whole company into a spy machine, whether you like it or not. And will be voted on in days. The entire industry needs to be lobbying to kill this thing. This is what a red alert moment looks like, Snowden said. Someone who's uh, really, I think, made made it his mission to educate all of us about FISA and how damaging it is to the United States. He is former FBI agent Kyle Serafin, host of the Kyle Serafin Show, and joins us right now to talk more about this. Kyle, great to see you. Welcome back here to the show. Thanks for having me on, Clayton. Look forward to it. So you've, of course, really been trying to educate all of us about this carve out, this 702 provision, which would allow, uh, which has been allowing the FBI and intelligence agencies to spy illegally on Americans without a warrant. We saw the fight unfolding in the House of Representatives last week. We saw Congressman Thomas Massey, Representative Luna and others standing up saying, we want a warrant. You have, must get a warrant for this. That, of course, was sidestepped. And now the House of Representatives looks like it's going to move forward with this and then pass this over to the Senate where this will become law, another extension of a multiple years. Um, where do things stand right now? 
And then I'll ask you how to get into the nitty gritty. Why is this so bad for America? Sure. Well, as you said, uh, people are, are fundamentally making disingenuous arguments. I think that's the real problem. We're seeing that members of Congress, either they don't understand what it is they're voting on or they are voting on it in bad faith. But uh, we are going to see this thing passed. I think there's no question about that. And it is going to continue this unconstitutional program. I mean, it's, it's actually unconstitutional on its face. And uh, so when we see people making arguments about it and you see the arguments are so simplistic and they don't actually reflect the reality. It makes me think that none of them actually have gone into a skiff, seen what the day-to-day -day operations of the NSA and of the FBI and that conjunction, that crossover with 702 looks like. I, I would just be really curious to know if a Mike Johnson went into a skiff and was shown, you know, I don't know that he was blackmailed. I think it's probably more about money. That's usually how these things work. It's usually much more simple and less conspiratorial than people would like it to be. But my curiosity is this, did he actually see and was he actually convinced that there were cases that 702 FISA stopped from happening? Terrorist cases, terrorist plots that were foiled, that some American lives were saved? Because I just, I've never seen the evidence of it. And I did counterterrorism for three years all over the country. And then I also spent two years sitting in a skiff reading this stuff. So it doesn't make any sense to me having been on the other end of it. Yeah, you've been in the skiff many, many times. And when this, when Mike Johnson last week came out and said publicly, look, I was with you guys. I was with you guys. I was, I wanted to end this, right? I was on your side of the table. And then I went into the skiff, he said, and then I saw stuff that absolutely terrified me. And now I've completely did a 180. I flip-flopped and I saw your tweets on this. You said, what, 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 what are you talking about? I've been in the skiff for many, many years. I've never seen anything. Do you, do you think that he's lying? I don't know what he's doing. And I don't like to ascribe motives without having evidence. So I just look at what he said and then I look at the people like Chris Ray who are out there and basically either lie or lie by omission to the American people for a living. It's my kind of contention at this point. The director of the FBI's primary job is ensuring that he's not the last director of the FBI. That's kind of what he does. And, <laughs> and that may be a fundamentally profound thing for people to grasp. But his argument is on behalf of his agency, on behalf of adding funding to it, building a new headquarters, establishing its you know continued existence, when there are credible claims that it has stepped over the constitutional boundaries. And as we talked about the last time that you and I sat down, it is a secret police force for the federal government's interests. It is a law enforcement agency that also has access to raw intelligence data and is able to generate criminal cases from otherwise uninvestigatable topics. That should scare the crap out of all Americans. It's not American to have some group that's able to go out there and query you for no particular reason in violation of the Fourth Amendment and then generate a criminal case on something they had no right to look at in the first place. Well, it blows my mind, too, that you have a Republican House of Representatives, which arguably this was used to spy on the president of the United States, then Donald Trump. And to me, this seems like there's no way this is going to pass. And here we are passing the House of Representatives, going over to the Senate, where it looks like it will likely pass there as well, head on to the president, and he will extend this. Um, when you're talking to former or, or current members of the FBI, uh, do, do, they, do they want this? I mean, the argument from Chris Ray is we need this for American safety, right? This is the argument. Otherwise, you're not safe unless we have this carve out 702. We can spy on Americans illegally. I don't know that agents have specifically told me they want it or don't want it. It's a tool. It exists. You know, it's the status quo, but it's not the status quo for the entirety of the FBI. That's actually something that people should probably understand. The, the status of FISA 702, which is different from the traditional FISA warrant, the, the actual true FISA, the full FISA, as we talked about previously, that is a rigorous process. It may be convoluted if you lie in it, like they did with Kevin Kleinsmith and go in and flip an email so it says the opposite of what it stated. But the, the actual process of going in front of the FISC, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, it is an ex parte hearing where only the government presents their side, but they actually have to meet a burden that shows that it is justifiable to engage in this very aggressive spying techniques. And we're using the word spying loosely, but it's intelligence gathering. We're putting in microphones. We are going and capturing all of your transactions from your phone. You know, all these different sort of tools that are incredibly invasive, probably the most invasive thing you can do. 702 FISA is very different than that. And everyone that is making these arguments in Congress that I'm seeing are, are stating, well, it's going after bad guys and foreign terrorists and intelligence operatives. And you go, okay, fine. Um, well, they don't have any constitutional liberties, a Ch Chinese spy in China or a Russian spy in Russia or Iranian operative in, in Iran doesn't have any constitutional protections. But what about when they're talking to Americans? There's somebody on the other end of that email. 
And most of what intelligence work is doing is not overtly saying, I am this person, I represent this government, I am looking to corrupt you. Would you be willing to take money and sell out your nation? That's not how intelligence work. That's, that's so on the nose, it doesn't work. So it's almost always about eliciting information. It's about, can I softly touch you and get you to send me things as uh, maybe I'm a foreign journalist, or maybe I'm a foreign business person, and this would be advantageous to us to be able to do something. So I'm going to gather information in a way that makes you feel like you're not actually participating in something wrong. And if I, as a U.S. citizen, am operating in good faith, and a bad faith actor from outside of the United States has targeted me, do we really want the FBI to open a full investigation on me, the American citizen who's being targeted? and be able to have access to all of my communications without having a warrant when they think that I might be engaged in something that I'm just being conned into? This is really the question that it should come down to. If there is enough burden for the FBI to go after it, it's actually not that big of a deal to go get a warrant. The problem is, is they're not gonna actually meet the warrant requirements because they're not gonna be able to find probable cause that a federal crime has been committed. So they that's, gather why, that's yes. why they're really pushing back against this warrant provision, of course, brought up by uh, Congressman Massey uh, and others try pushing for this, which is, yeah, just, okay, if you want to then look at the American who might be the target of this, just go get a warrant. That's it. By the way, they put a carve out in there for members of Congress, which is hilarious, right? So they carved that out so that members of Congress would be have to be notified. We're looking into this. We need you to sign off and agree to it. Why not for, why not for regular Americans? Why just this carve out for members of Congress? It's, it's, uh, it's absurd. It, it looks like they're buying them off. The other thing is this. This actually changed fundamentally. Um, you can actually find things on uh, articles like TechCrunch. I'll, I'll send you a link to it. But uh, these articles have been written, and people recognize that there was a change in the surveillance state and the technological abilities of the FBI right at the end of the Obama era, just about to walk into Trump. And so the scary thing was for the, for the people on the political left, they were like, oh, my God. Uh, Obama is handing over the keys to the federal surveillance state, and Trump is going to have all this unfettered access to raw FISA with the FBI. Well, why would that happen if you're, if you're Barack Obama and you're looking at a Donald Trump presidency coming in? We already know that the Obama administration basically set up to sabotage Donald Trump, that they investigated his, his campaign, that the FBI treated Donald Trump's campaign and Hillary Clinton's campaigns differently. One got defensive briefing saying, hey, you might be targeted. The other one got investigated and had FISA's and Carter Page and so on. So we saw a fundamentally different treatment between the left and the right. And so to assume that the surveillance state and the intelligence apparatus is operating in a good faith, right down the middle, nonpartisan way is false. The NSA's database of 702 data, which is literally me looking into your email box. People have to understand what raw FISA is. It's exactly what you see. I get your spam. I get the, com you know, the, the notes back and forth to your mom. I get the notes that you and your wife are exchanging, which is otherwise privileged material, and your lawyers. I see all of it raw with no filter. And then I, as an FBI agent, have to decide whether or not it is in fact something that I have to quote unquote minimize. And I'll just tell you, as someone who did this for two years in a skiff working against the Chinese threat, I have a pretty high IQ. I have a, I'm a better than average learner. And I sat in that skiff and I thought I was minimizing things appropriately by using the protocols that were taught to me. By the way, I had a Chinese, uh, native Chinese speaking agent as a training agent who didn't know how to use the programs either. And it didn't seem like anybody on my squad knew how to use them. So when they did a FISA audit of me on my squad about what I had been doing with 702 FISA, I failed it miserably. And so did everybody else because we weren't minimizing it properly because it doesn't even do the thing you think. When you click through the minimization process, it doesn't result in it actually doing the thing that it's supposed to do within that software. So that's fairly incredible. Wow. But we failed FISA audits over and over again because the software may have failed us. But then you're just basically relying on, is Kyle Serafin, is fill-in-the-blank FBI agent that is looking at this stuff, a person of good moral repute who is not going to go out and abuse the process and build criminal investigations when they should be looking for intelligence. And that's, that's literally a gamble on every single person's character. When we know that they have unfettered access to raw intelligence, it's not like it shows up and it says, you know, person A, instead of Clayton Morris. It, no, it shows up and it says Clayton Morris at your, at your Yahoo, at your Gmail, at your fill in the blank email address. And I'm reading what's in your box. And then I have to decide whether or not I'm gonna handle it properly. And if I choose not to, there's no guardrails to stop it. That happened in 2016 going into the Trump presidency before he was inaugurated. And people were worried, oh my God, will he abuse it? The answer was it was put in place to abuse the process and go after him. 
And we saw that happen. That's what that's what Crossfire Hurricane was all about. It was about seeing a weaponized DOJ that never was handed over to another administration. It never answered to Donald Trump, maybe nominally, but not in functionality. That's what a deep state is. And when people understand that, it makes far more sense. Look, if the political left, like the far wing of the political left and the people on the, uh, you know, the ACLU and the people on the far end of the right, which is people who just believe in the Constitution now, like me, are in total agreement and the 80 percent of Congress in the middle wants to vote for this package and wants to move it forward, you know something is wrong. That's sort of what we talk about with a uniparty. The status quo is more accurate than uniparty. The status quo people are keeping a status quo, but that's a new status quo since 2016. Something has got to be going on here that uh, something doesn't smell right at all. And Marjorie Taylor Greene talked with, about this with uh, with Tucker just a few weeks ago. You know, what do, is there something that they have on him? Is he being blackmailed? How do you how do you flip flop on almost every position after taking your speakership and leaving the American people behind? Something is going on here. Um, you know, do, I want to get your thoughts on what Edward Snowden said specifically about the NSA is just days away from taking over the Internet. Is he being hyperbolic here or is he being accurate? I think there's always a little bit of trying to shock people into movement because the American people are pretty complacent right now. And as long as Netflix turns on and as long as Costco still has food and, you know, Uber Eats is still functioning, then a lot of people will not do anything. So there's a possibility that, that that's sort of the hyperbolic push of taking over the Internet. But we've seen very, very big creeps in uh, destruction of our freedom of speech, in government weighing in on censorship. That's why we have the Missouri v. Biden case going on right now. You know, there there is some obvious red flags. So I think it's a little bit of both, if I'm going to be real honest about it. But as you mentioned earlier, the, you know, these these folks, what do they have on them? I can't rule out that they're just being lied to. You know, the FBI will present this really good game as we've got all this danger going on and look at what we're saving. And then you go see what the actual actionable items are in the counterterrorism space, for example. And they went after a kid in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, who was 18 years old, which means he was being investigated as a minor. And the first line of the probable cause statement in his arrest warrant states that he was making contact with an online CHS, a confidential human source who worked for the FBI representing that, that person to be ISIS. So you know, the threat isn't really that big when your real, your big arrest in the terrorism world is that you found an 18 year old kid whose claim was he was going to light a sword on fire. He was going to use flaming weapons. That's an actual quote from the probable cause statement. And he was going to obtain firearms by hitting his dad in the head with a lead pipe because apparently he, you know, watches Clue or played the, the board game and thought that was the way that you obtain weapons, right? This is not serious stuff. If you have to manufacture terrorism, in order to show people how bad the terrorism problem is. That's the self-licking ice cream cone of Washington, DC. That's that belt mentality, which is like, we've been doing this forever, why would we not do it? And then you just look and what are Johnson's priorities? $100 million in Ukrainian aid and Israeli aid and so on, funding a foreign war, and then calling yourself a wartime president. I mean, is he talking about the American civil war? Is he talking about the foreign wars? And if he's serious, why not just a declaration of war? Because that's actually in the constitution. They could do that. It's unbelievable. Well, this is about to happen. And uh, I don't know if there's anything that we can do to stop it. I mean, we've had, we've been calling on everyone to call their representatives, call their members of the Senate, uh, call their offices, flood their offices with it. But you have a Speaker of the House that knows that the American people don't want this. And he's still uh, tabled uh, motions to vacate. He's putting all of this through to ram it through because he saw something. He saw something that terrified him. Uh, Kyle, great to see you as always. I encourage all of our audience to, to pay attention to what Kyle says on his show. I'm very, very uh, lucid on this um, and really one of the loud voices on trying to stop this 702 uh, carve out in this. We really appreciate it, Kyle, as always. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate it. All right. We're going to see what, what Congress does on this. We'll be watching it very closely. Um, I haven't seen Edward Snowden this active on social media <laughs> Like he is flipping out about it because yeah. I think most people are asleep. And I think like what Kyle just said, most people just like if their Netflix comes on, you know, their Uber Eats arrives, then they're fine. But they don't realize that what government is doing behind the scenes right now is going to take personal liberties away from all of us and right. allow them to spy on us. So, well, we have more yeah, news. I mean, it, oh, please. It's, it's like his, his Twitter was so busy that I had to I had to ask Clayton to go find those things because he was like oh, i want to mention these tweets and i was like going through Edward yeah. snowden's twitter and i was like i can't find them it's like, i told him it's like it's way too busy here like please yeah. if you have these let me know 
Yeah. So hopefully people are paying. Because he goes through like quiet periods where he's just like, you know, and then suddenly he's like, please, people, wake up, pay attention to this. Yeah. He's anyway. basically begging and screaming. So let's listen. All right. Well, we have more news to get to. We're going to talk about Ukraine and the new rules of the draft that will make you want to pull your hair out. But don't do that because our sponsor, Provia, wants you to know that, hey, thinning hair, that's the way of the world. And sometimes when these news stories really get to you, I notice my hair's getting a little thin or I want to pull it out. There are other reasons, of course, your hair could thin, stress, diet, genetics. But now Provia offers a real solution that delivers on its promise without the harsh side effects, unwanted chemicals, and no need for a prescription. Because Provia uses safe natural ingredients, ProCapil, to effectively target the three main causes of premature hair thinning and loss by supporting healthy scalp circulation, the delivery of nourishing ingredients, and healthy hair follicle anchoring to your scalp, Provia guarantees more head on your hair than in the shower or on your comb. And right now, new customers can save over 50% off plus free shipping on Provia's introductory package at proviahair.com slash redacted. Every package includes a full 60-day supply of Provia serum, for daily use, plus the Provia Super Concentrate for faster, more noticeable results. And every order includes your choice of a free gift right now at checkout. So Provia works, it's guaranteed, or your money 100% back. So don't wait. Order now and get free shipping. That's proviahair.com slash redacted. One more time, that's proviahair.com slash redacted. All right, well, remember how Western countries really broke their arm, patting themselves on the back about how we were so kind for taking in Ukrainians because their country was at war, good mm -hmm. for us. Two years ago, these were the headlines that we could not get away from. This was about how awesome we are for helping Ukrainian refugees. Uh, this was from the, New, uh, the Washington Post two years ago. Well, that warm welcome seems to be over for Ukrainians, and now they are all being sent right back, according to new draft rules signed into law by Zelensky just this week. Here are some of the more shocking changes. First off, all Ukrainians between the ages of 16 and 60 must now carry their military papers at all times. So if a police stops them and they don't have proof that they've registered for the draft, they're in deep doo-doo. If they don't have these papers, a police can forcibly take them into a conscription office, never to be seen again, presumably. Uh, even, you know, if you are already at war, one of the things that these new rules had promised was that the soldiers who have been there for now two years are going to have some rules about when they can go home. They don't have a tour like, oh, the, I'll be there six months or something. They've been there, the ones that have survived, and they want to go home. They're tired. So the original document was expected to provide for the demobilization and maybe rotate in some new people. But at the last minute, they removed that from the bill. They say they're going to draft something separate to demilitarize those people, but I would not hold your breath. So think about it. We're supposed to care about them, right? Our media tells them we care about them. We don't, clearly. We just want them to keep dying and winning a war that we can congratulate ourselves about. No one cares about these Ukrainian soldiers except us here on Redacted. Uh, and so those of the, the soldiers that are there, unequipped and untrained, should go home and peace talks should happen. But at the very least, they should go home and Ukraine promised them that they would be going home. And now they're not. Can you even imagine? Can you no. imagine how that feels? It's awful. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. awful. It's it's unbelievable. And, and so, yeah, they seek refuge in these other countries. Now they're being told by the by their, their... No, no, we're talking about the men on the front lines now who have been waiting for instructions. Oh, yeah, yeah. They yeah. were promised that this bill would give them at least some kind of silver lining of when they can come home. They don't get that. Look how Western media lies about this. This is Reuters from today. Ukraine Zelensky signs new army draft to reinforce exhausted troops. Well, that's a lie because it's not helping those exhausted troops. They have to stay there. That's it. They're, they're not, not being replaced. And normally you would it's go. It's a trick. Yeah. Normally you would be shuffled in, shuffled out, right? Yeah. Shuffled in, shuffled out. They're not at all. And they've been stuck there. They know when they're going there, they're going there to die. They're not coming home. 
But the ones that are still there that have survived were promised with this bill that there would be rules for when they can come home. And Zelensky and his government at the last minute removed that. And that's an awful trick. That's a dirty game. Someone said in the chat, uh, Angela says, well done, redacted, caring about the Ukrainian soldiers. We have from the beginning been saying that you're literally they have no NATO, business there. NATO is being NATO is sending them there to die. Yeah. You're wiping out an entire generation of young men right now because of this war. No, we don't care about that. We care about putting their them on their social, the flags on their social media, right? We care about, and I just can't get over how different of an environment this was. Because again, I remember, we live here in Europe, that when the war began, there were mom's chats and pleas from our, our school, bring in any blankets or extra clothes, car seats that you have. And everyone was so excited to help Ukrainian refugees take one into your house. Can you give them a ride? Can you help them with their paperwork? Well, now they're saying, hey, they're sending us back. We don't have we don't have documentation to stay here anymore. And we're going to be sent to die. No one's helping them. If we cared, we would say, no, wait, we took these people in. They're safe here. They're staying. They're not being sent back for a pointless war. We don't. Their friends and family are dying on the front lines because their leaders refuse to cede that territory that doesn't want to be them Ukraine anyway. And so now look at all of these men who will be dragnet into this army to die untrained. So let's go back to some of the rules. Yeah, go our ahead. Aren't we in about three generations of men now? Yeah, I know. I say They're one generation. generation. But if you're talking yeah. that 16-year-olds have to carry these papers on them, right, yeah. they'll be thrown in. Um, and we know that you know, many young people have already been grabbed and thrown They're in They're not anyway. supposed to. I know the, they're not supposed to, but they are. They are. Yeah. And all the way up until 60 years old. And we, we've seen the horrible videos of individuals with Down syndrome being thrown into this as well. I mean, it's just absolutely awful right now. Please stop it. Right. OK, let's go back to the rules. Uh, now it puts into place university students must all do military training starting in 2025. Recruiters no longer have to find a person to draft them before conscription notices had to be delivered in person. But now if they send it in the mail, they consider it delivered. You're drafted. And if you don't comply, they're coming for you. Failure to comply with the draft means big fines. Also, your driver's license will be revoked. Uh, a separate law lowers the age from 27 to 25 for mandatory conscription. And this is what's causing the most panic of all of those Ukrainians that those of us outside of Ukraine, we took such good care of them. But now they're panicked because those services will totally dry up unless they rev register for military service. So that means Ukrainians who go to consulates abroad will be automatically registered to be drafted. So say you need to renew something or get some kind of service from the Ukrainian consulate and you are a refugee, let's say in Spain, well, you're not gonna go back to that consulate because you know you'll be drafted and sent into the war. Now they're saying they're not gonna do forced deportations, but we'll just see about that because Europe has been very wimpy, I'm going to say. European leaders have said, well, we don't think we're going to be sending those people back. But you don't know. I wouldn't trust a European leader as far as I could throw them. So that means that if you're one of those Ukrainians who was treated so nicely when you escaped in 2022, you're not anymore. Uh, if you go to a consulate for any reason, you'll be drafted. That's why scenes like this were happening in the last few days in the run-up of this law being passed. So what you're seeing here is a line to get into the Ukrainian consulate in Prague. So all of these people want to hurry up and get their services taken care of because they don't want to have to go back to the consulate for any reason at risk of being drafted. Uh, this is reportedly what the wait line looked like to get into the Ukrainian consulate in Warsaw. Jeez. Yeah, it's bad. It's bad in Poland right now. So think of wow. how stressful this is for them. They're welcomed into Western countries. You know, they have all of this press. They're treated well. But now those same countries won't protect them from Zelensky's war. And they'll be sent back to leave their families and go to a war that could end today if Zelensky wanted it to. And are we going to help them now? Now that after two years after we congratulated ourselves in the West for doing that? Apparently we're not. Our government is A-OK -okay with these new draconian draft rules and them dying, 
Uh, we just want to send their government more money so that these men can go to their deaths. Uh, here's one more awful change to this law. It removes the concept of partially fit for military service. So they can be drafting people with disabilities. They can be drafting people with one limb. Off you go. Uh, and if you were already declared unfit to serve by a medical exam, you're going to have to resubmit to that exam again. They say they've opened 10 new conscription, conscription offices so that they can re-examine anyone. So even if you thought, no, I'm safe, I have a medical exemption because I have a disease, I'm missing a limb, for whatever reason, not so fast. You're going to have to get that again. Uh, now, we will see more things like this. Sputnik News reporter Ossie Kosak had posted videos online of Ukrainian soldier fighting with Down syndrome, and he was really abused in this video. I'm choosing not to show it to you because yeah, it's upsetting. It. It's it, awful. It's not a video. I, I just took a still. Uh, you can seek this out if you want. Um, but this is within the realm of possibility now. Um, at, again, at least 10 new military recruitment offices were opened to catch these guys. So inevitably, we will see more videos like this one of a man being pulled off public transportation in Odessa earlier this year. Can you imagine the fear like you're on your way to work, you're on your way trying to earn a living, you leave the house. There's so many reports of these young men like leaving the house to go to work or just yeah. to, to go to the grocery store to get food for their family. And I mean, that's what thrown in that's the what, bus. what protecting democracy looks like, though. You know, mm -hmm. I mean. If you're going to really protect yeah. democracy, I get yeah, our I freedom, but not theirs. It's awful. Yeah. yeah. It's awful. Um, no, it, none of this makes sense because Zelensky never makes sense. He said in January it's to a, a German. Do to right. Uh, he said to a German broadcaster that they had almost a million troops and they were doing just fine. This was in January, a quote from Zelensky to German media. He says, besides, we have a workforce of about 30 million people. Even though I can't provide the exact number, there's some 6.5 to 7.5 million people have moved abroad. And again, I can't give you the accurate figure. So he said, we have almost a million troops and I have this 30 million to pull from. So I'm good. Well, I guess that's exactly what he's doing. Also, I wonder how he got that extra 200,000 people, because in February, before the conflict broke out, they said they only had 260,000 um, and in December, they said they had 600,000. So even though we know they're dying at a rapid rate, somehow they're growing. I don't know if it's maybe that's what's the Star Wars army, the, you know, the clones, the clone wars, right. something clones. like that. Yeah. Um, th I, that's the only way these numbers make sense or he's talking out of his ass. What do you think? Those are the only two options. <laughs> we know what he's talking about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, okay. The only silver lining here is that the new law does not seem to include forced conscription of women yet, yet. because we've been following this and we warned you that Ukrainian officials were warning that they thought that they would have to do this. Here's a video from earlier this year, our Ukrainian from uh, several months ago, Ukrainian army Lieutenant Colonel Nikolov said that they would need total mobilization of the entire male and female population from the age of 18, even so far as forcing prisoners into the army, as if that would be the only way that Ukraine could win. Сейчас главное не проиграть. Так вот для того, чтобы не проиграть, необходимо не просто провести поломаризацию, необходимы драконовские методы. Как я это вижу. Это тотальная мобилизация всех, всего мужского и женского населения с 18 лет. Не обязательно это должна быть передовая, это может быть оборонные какие-то предприятия, это может быть тыл, логистика. Можно в какую-то другую оберку обернуть, там, резервисты и так далее. Но с 18 лет, включая женщин, необходимо привлечь заключенных для выполнения боевых задач. Уязнали? Так точно. А каким чином это сделать? Это же противоречит украинскому законодательству. Идет война 10 лет. Неужели не научились сделать замену до законодательства? Окей, so said that's against the law. And he's like, well, we've been at war for 10 years. We can change the law. That's exactly what they did. Does 
Does the doc do the documents define what a woman is over there? Do, do they know what that is over there? Or? Good point. Good point. Because we have seen those spoof videos where Ukrainian men dress as women to avoid conscription, um, but that's a joke so far. Uh, again, also, sorry, but it's kind of kind of an aside. But am I the only one that noticed that that guy's sweatshirt was just like the symbolism on his sweatshirt? I won't say what it reminds me of because we got in trouble for using that word one time, but oh. it starts with N and ends in A-Z-I. But it, it looked like a, a the, his, his sweatshirt looked like it had like, I, I, I couldn't quite see it because it was so small, but it looked like it had a freaking SS symbol on his arm. Yeah. Like, just, just an aside, I know that's not important what's going on here, but. Yeah, yeah, that guy rhymes with Yahtzee, if you like that game, the yeah. dice game. My grandma liked Yahtzee. Um, you're right. And when he was talking about the 10 years that Ukraine, he says this year's this war has been going on for 10 years. Well, those Yahtzee players are the ones who've been waging that war for 10 years. So good observation. So I ask you, who will speak for the Ukrainians in this dragnet of a war? Who will tell them that their lives will not move back this line? Every time we talk about this, I think it's important to revisit the map. So here is the map. On June 1st, 2023, when we were told the counteroffensive started, they threw many lives at this red line in order to move it back to white to become Ukraine, even though the people in those regions voted and asked to become Russia because they were tired of being bombed and terrorized by Ukraine. This is a map of the war as of yesterday. It did not move. Ukraine has made no progress to re regain that territory, nor should they. Um, again, Ukraine has been bombing those regions since 2014. The media wants us to pretend that we never knew that, but there's lots of reporting from 2014 if we care to go back and look. Here's, uh, here's a report that covers it from Sputnik News if you'd like to go over it, but a lot of Western sources have it too. So given that those regions asked Russia to help the terror to stop and those regions voted to join Russia, Ukraine must stop sending men to their death to take that territory back. These men must be allowed to live out their lives in peace because one, they don't deserve it. Ukraine didn't treat those people in the Donbass well, and they only want that land back because it's rich in uranium and other natural resources. And two, they won't succeed no matter how many men they threw at that, throw at that line. Um, so with all of that, U.S. House Speaker Mike Johnson says, oh, no, we're still going to continue to support Ukraine with military aid. He's about to put a bill up for vote in Congress. The number was originally supposed to be 60 billion, but now he's saying he needs 95 billion in order to send aid to Ukraine. But that also includes aid for Israel. He says he needs to do that because he considers himself a wartime speaker. We talked about this earlier, but here's how he is presenting it. Ukraine needs the money and I'm a leader of a war. Um, look, we are in we are in unprecedented times, okay? Um, we're in dangerous times, as has been articulated here, around the world and here at home. We need steady leadership. We need steady hands at the wheel. I, look, I regard myself as a, as a wartime speaker. I mean, in a literal sense, we are. I knew that when I took the gavel. I didn't anticipate that this would be an easy path. Former Speaker Newt Gingrich posted a couple days ago on his social media that um, this is the hardest challenge that's faced a speaker probably in the history of the country, in the moment that we're in right now. He said, arguably, uh, may be comparable to the Civil War, but maybe worse. Okay. The extreme irony is that he won't put, if he thinks he's a wartime speaker, he should put these wars up for a vote to Congress. We should get a vote then. Don't call yourself a wartime speaker and keep sneaking wars in, sliding them, putting them under your plate like your broccoli. It, that's wrong. So it kills me that he says that. And they insult us by not voting for war, because at least then we could see them doing this out in the plain, out in plain sight. Um, but he's not a wartime speaker because he refuses to put these for a vote. So that makes me bonkers. Do you join me in that sentiment? How do you feel? Let us know in the chat below. Oh, that's crazy. All right, Ukraine, keep it up. Keep up the good work over there. Uh, we've got more news to get to here. We're going to talk about 
Justin Trudeau and trying to bankrupt the Canadian people um, and also sending more money to Ukraine. That's on the docket right now. Canada, can you afford to send more money to Ukraine? Your corrupt politicians want you to. We'll talk about that in a second. Plus, NPR's big failure. What's going on at NPR? Well, we've got some news on that. It's a pretty interesting story. You wouldn't want to miss that. But first, I can't wait to tell you about today's sponsor, okay? We're... The, 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 the studies are in on sleep and how incredibly important it is for you. I'm going to tell you right now, you can get 50% off an at-home sleep test. If you go to trysleepdoctor.com slash redacted, if you're constantly feeling tired, you're struggling to maintain focus, you're finding it difficult to stay awake during the day, well, I'm telling you, and you, know, you can just keep shoving more coffee in your face. It's not going to work. Um, it's probably not your fault, though. When I first started in television, I worked in Los Angeles um, at the Fox affiliate on Bundy in West Los Angeles. One of our morning news anchors had sleep apnea. And after the morning show, you could hear him snoring all through the upper offices. And it wasn't until he went to a sleep lab and figured out that he had sleep apnea, he was finally able to get an at-home device that could help him sleep. And he was like a new man as a result of it. But guess what? Three in four U.S. adults have sleep disorder syndromes and uh, symptoms. And normally you have to go to one of these labs. It can be very dangerous, high blood pressure, heart problems, liver problems. And it could be a huge nuisance to your partner as well if you have sleep apnea. So I'm excited to tell you about our, our sponsor, Sleep Doctor, because you can do this at home. The Sleep Doctor is an FDA-approved at-home sleep test that accurately measures key sleep metrics to diagnose the root cause of your sleep problems from comfort of your home. No more staying in a lab overnight. You don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to be hooked up to machines in a strange bed away from home. So, and you're not going to get the best sleep patterns if you have to stay in one of these places anyway. With the Sleep Doctor's test, you take it at home, you test your own you test it on your own in your own bed for a fraction of the cost. Starting is easy. First, you schedule a brief video chat with their board certified physician right over the, the internet, and it'll approve your at home sleep test. You'll receive the device in three business days. It's easy to use. The easy to use device records your at sleep breathing patterns and automatically shares results with the doctor all in one night of sleep. After the doctor then reviews your sleep data, you receive a personalized sleep report and therapy recommendations if diagnosed. It is critical to get a good night's sleep. So right now you can get 50% off your at-home sleep apnea test. Just go to this link, trysleepdoctor.com slash redacted. Your body and mind will thank you for it. Again, 50% off. Go to trysleepdoctor.com slash redacted. Well, Justin Trudeau's cabinet and government appears to be following the same footsteps as the Biden administration in the United States, driving Canada into a massive debt bubble that's about to burst. The United States, of course, hitting about $35 trillion in debt. The new budget, though, up for debate right now in Canada, <laughs> adds billions more to the nation's deficit. And of course, you know, a huge piece of that is sending money to Ukraine. So what's actually inside of this new budget and how will it bankrupt Canadians? Let's bring in journalist uh, from Canada, David Creighton, who writes at the Post Millennial, joins us from Ottawa, who's been pouring through this budget, God bless you, over the past uh, few days. Now, this is not law yet. It hasn't come up for a vote just yet. It's not finalized yet. But this is what's being proposed, David. What, what stands out to you in this mess? What stands out to me is that Justin Trudeau and Christia Freeland, his finance minister, have added another $40 billion of debt to an already expansive national debt. So this is another deficit budget. Trudeau, of course, when he first came to power, said he was going to offer fiscally responsible budgets and balanced budgets. Hasn't offered one in, in the last eight years. And of course, but he says, don't worry about that. The budget will take care of itself. And that's more As budgets story. often do. Can you imagine running your family like that? <laughs> the budget will just, it'll take care of itself. Well, precisely. And of course they haven't, but we are so awash in debt in this country. And there's, there's $52.9 billion of new spending in this budget. And ironically, 
the military won't be getting much of that because just last week Trudeau was was in a Air Force wing in Trenton, Ontario, and he announced that he was going to be upping defense spending. That was his priority. Well, there's very little in this budget for defense spending because that's what Trudeau and most prime ministers, especially liberal over the over the past 30 years, have done. As they say, you know, in 10 years time, you'll be getting the money. So that looks like what's happened here. So where is the 52.9 billion going? To a lot of boutique programs. They're promising 40 million new homes to be built with $8.5 billion that they put in housing. This is all definitely targeting, I guess, the Gen Z or Gen X or <laughs> younger people who can't afford a home. Right. But what are we looking at here? We're going to be looking at government housing and people being unable to afford real housing. And this is going to put us in a permanent phase of the government supplying housing that will inevitably just become a taxpayer burden. And so this is not a budget that anybody is really cheering about. In fact, a lot of former uh, Bank of Canada people have been saying that this is the worst budget in 30 years. David Dodge, for instance, said that yesterday, former governor of the Bank of Canada. So there's not a lot of euphoria on the left for this budget, and certainly not on the right, because this is more spending there's also yeah. a big piece of this is capital gains, right? This is another big piece of this budget, which is just shocking for investors who want to build affordable housing, want to build housing, and then want to turn a profit, right? After all, in the United States, if you partner with the government, there's an enormous amount of tax incentives for you to partner with the United States government. Very little bit of the tax code is actually taking money out of your pocket. Most people don't understand that. Most of the tax code in the U.S. is for businesses to build businesses or in uh, home builders to build homes. And of course, if you build homes, then you're partnering with the government to allow you get some tax breaks, et cetera. You get to write offs, capital gains, a whole, you know, a whole host of issues. But now it seems like Canada is going after entrepreneurs. It's specifically targeting this capital gains. This is astonishing number. Can you tell our audience about this? It is astonishing because it, it not only increases the percentage on capital gains transactions. It basically, Trudeau is redefining what rich people are because all we heard yesterday from Freeland was we're going to tax the rich. And of course, it sounds like a bloody socialist country when you start talking like that. Tax the rich, tax the rich. How are you gonna tax the rich, Christia Freeland? Well, we're going to increase the capital gains tax on transactions above $250,000 from 50% to 66.7%. So now the government's going to claw back two thirds of that transaction, literally two thirds of that transaction. And that to me doesn't necessarily sound like the super rich when you talk about transactions above 250,000. Most people need to make that much a year just to survive in this economy. Yeah. So I think what Trudeau's doing here is redefining what the rich are. He's now grouping at least the upper middle class, if not the middle middle class, into who he deems to be rich people. And this, of course, is going, and he actually had the nerve to say in this budget that the, the goal here is the redistribution of wealth in Canada. Of course. Now, that is socialism par one. And true in his unalloyed narcissism, thinks Canadians are going to buy into this, like he thinks Canadians will buy into all of his schemes because he says so. You know, the one of the big outlays of spending, of course, in Canada has been funding the war in Ukraine and funneling billions of dollars, both in money and weapons to Ukraine. And Justin Trudeau has championed this, of course. You guys just had a visitor up there from the UK. <laughs> who blew in with his hair a ruffle um, to encourage Canadians, make sure, you know, you're sending more money to Ukraine. Tell us about this, because this goes, this to me is tied very closely to this budget right now. Well, yes, of course. And because that's one of the reasons Canada is awash in debt. It's been giving billions way above its, its, uh, its ability to do so to Ukraine and for the war, to keep the war going. So, Former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was in town as a key speaker at the Canada Strong and Free 
conference. And, and this is an event that is Canada's CPAC. It brings together a lot of the small C conservative, small C libertarian, as well as the primary people in the Conservative Party Canada into an event to network and to listen to each other. So Boris Johnson's invited there. And my first question was, Boris, did you stagger or crawl to the meeting? Because you show up in your rumpled suit, your tie is askew, your hair is all over the place as usual. And what is your message to the Conservatives? Please keep giving to Ukraine. Give generously, billions, please. And the reason? Well, because it's a good, it's a cost-effective investment because Ukrainians are dying. Canadians and Americans aren't dying. NATO countries aren't, aren't giving anything to this except money. And the Ukrainians are dying. So it's a good investment that way. And he says, besides, think about where the money's going to buy these armaments. It's the military industrial establishment in your own country, in the United States. And of course, Canada has all of those Raytheon and other plants that are American uh, subsidiaries that operate in Canada. So he was hoping that would have a fertile audience in Canada by saying, hey, the armaments industry is getting these dollars. So it's not like they're really leaving the country. They're going into this, this military industrial complex, which is, is sucked up tens of hundreds of billions of dollars now into this war and the war in the Middle East. And, you know, I wanted to see somebody stand up in that crowd. And I, I was not there that day, but I was able to record. Somebody stand up and say, enough, stop, stop. Stop getting on your stand and pleading for war because we've got to stop this war and we've got to stop giving money into the black hole of Kiev. But interestingly enough, Clayton, just after he made he made that special announcement to conservatives, of course, he's supposed to be a conservative, right? He meets briefly with Stephen Gilbo outside the main door of the House of Commons and gives him a, an embrace, shakes his hand and, and says, you're doing a fantastic job, Stephen. Keep it up. And this, of course, is the Environment and Climate Change Minister in Canada who is decimating the Canadian economy, who is absolutely <laughs> completely destroying our oil and gas industry, who is part of the carbon tax that is impoverishing farmers, businessmen, people, ordinary Canadians everywhere. And so Boris Johnson thinks he's doing a fantastic job at raping the oil and gas industry in Canada. I ask you, Clayton, do these politicians have any ideals, have any principles, any, se any sense of what they really stand up for except themselves anymore? I don't know. I don't know. You'd be hard pressed to find it. We could ask our audience, how many, are there any politicians out there right now that you, you could stand up and rally around? I mean, you could probably count them on one hand who stand on principle and who are not motivated by greed or other nefarious factors. Um, well, yeah, you, you know, and Canada will continue to dig its own grave um, by sending billions more into Ukraine and the United States, of course, the vote uh, in the House is coming up here, and the United States seems poised to do the exact same thing under Speaker Johnson, sending another $70 billion to Ukraine that we do not have, cannot afford, um, and it will be saddled on the American taxpayers once again. David Creighton, thank you as always for joining us from Canada, keeping us abreast of what's going on up there um, above the border. We appreciate it as always. Thanks, David. Well, thank you so much, Clayton. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Someone in the chat was just asking a moment ago, can, do you guys have any information on this Indonesian uh, volcano situation? And it's, it looks bad. Uh, of course, we all remember what happened back in 2004 during that Christmas season in 2004 uh, when, of course, the that massive earthquake struck, 9.1 magnitude yes. struck, and hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives as a result of it. So just a, a few short hours ago, now there is a tsunami warning as this volcano has erupted. Um, a, tens of thousands of people being evacuated right now, being told to leave the area in, 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 in Indonesia um, and a series of massive eruptions around this. So we'll keep our eye on that. And it, when it's worth, no one talks about this, but we we talk about this here on the show. It's worth noting that one of the largest uh, stories of child trafficking in history occurred after the Indonesian tsunami and what happened uh, back in 2004. So 
people prey on these people and these situations, these sick pieces, these sick pieces of garbage that do this. So that's one big piece of the story that uh, doesn't get coverage. But there's people that look for these world events and then they swoop right in and they grab children as a result of it. So um, that's something that uh, no one else will talk about. CNN won't talk about it, but we will. So we'll watch this story closely. All right. Well, we're following mainstream media. We're going to talk now about NPR because they have lost the plot completely. They say now that the First Amendment is a problem for their liberal ideological news network that is freedom of information. They don't like it. Your rights to information is something they are very worried about because they are off the deep end. Now, this video is being shared today, and it's a hot topic because of NPR's massive fail, uh, because they are so out of touch, and they are a propaganda machine, not a news network. Here is their new CEO, recently hired, Catherine Mayer, saying that the First Amendment is a threat to reporters. The number one challenge here that we we see and is, of course, the First Amendment in the United States pro, is a fairly robust um, right, uh, protection of rights. And and that is a protection of rights, both for platforms, which I actually think is very important that platforms have those rights to be able to regulate what kind of content they want on their sites. But it also means that it, it is a little bit tricky to really address some of the real challenges of where does bad information come from and sort of the influence peddlers who have made a real market economy around it. So okay. the First Amendment is really tricky. So NPR should have it, but you should not have it. That's what she thinks. Uh, okay. Now, this has been shared because a brave NPR news reporter published a heartbreaking piece about how NPR is not reporting the news because they have been ideologically captured by the left, and he was punished for it. So this story, to me, answers a lot of questions, because Clayton and I, when we were in mainstream media, I don't think we felt that people were purposely not looking at news stories and reporting them only from that. We certainly saw bias, but not nothing near like what we saw during the COVID pandemic, where it was like, nope, vaccine's safe and effective. We're not even gonna look. We're not gonna look there at all. Or no, it just, I don't know how this happened, but this brave man lays it out. And I think that it, we're gonna go over it because it resonates with me a lot. Um, and this matters a lot because NPR is publicly funded. So our tax dollars are going towards this non-journalism for ideology for only one political side. Here is the NPR news editor, Yuri Berliner, um, and this is NPR, re NPR reporting on itself, saying that they suspended him. He actually resigned today just a few hours ago because the CEO, this woman that we just showed you, instead of taking the lesson of what he had to say with humility and maybe thinking about it, no, she maligned him and disparaged him. Here is his resignation. He says, uh, I'm resigning. It's a great American institution, he says, and he doesn't support defunding NPR, although that's trending anyway. He says, you know, mostly it's because the CEO is disparaging me. She seems like she's a real humble piece of work, don't you think? Um, this is hilarious because on the reporting of this story, NPR assures us that they can report on themselves. They're like, here's a disclosure. This is an NPR story about an NPR story. So we followed our protocol and we think that that's all good. Okay. Now he was suspended because he wrote this piece for the, fr the free press which again, I think is eye-opening. I encourage you to read it in its entirety. What he says is that he was a bleeding heart liberal who drove a Subaru. And indeed, if you look at his coverage, I'm sure there's lots of things you may not agree with, but he says he at least understood when he took the job that NPR had a wide variety of an audience. It was not just liberals. They had conservatives too, and a lot of independents. Uh, and now, though, he says they've just stopped reporting stories, even if they so much as smell conservative, and that's not journalism. Now, maybe you think, no, NPR, it's always been liberal. Um, but he points out that that's not the case. What really started to turn away all of their audience except this small tribe of white liberals was Trump and Russiagate. He says that persistent rumors that the Trump campaign colluded with Russia over the election became catnip that drove reporting. So reporters just loved it 
because they hated Trump so much. So they just kept having Adam Schiff on because that was his shtick. He said, even when the Mueller report found no credible evidence of collusion, NPR's coverage was sparse and Russiagate just faded from our programming. He said, it's one thing to swing and miss. Like, okay, you got it wrong. I felt like that. I listened to Rachel Maddow. I swallowed all that crap. Okay, I, I need to figure out why I believed that then. What did I not look at? NPR did not do that. Instead, they just moved on with no mea culpa. He said, no self-reflection. And it just spun out of control from there. Other ways that they didn't follow journalistic protocol. Hunter Biden's laptop, they threw it out because they wanted to. And they never apologized when that became a legitimate story. The COVID lab leak, they called the lab leak theory crazy. When it turned out not to be crazy, they did not apologize. They didn't say, oh, well, we previously thought this. Here's what they said when we introduced our coverage. Uh, we said, nope, scientific evidence overwhelmingly points to a natural origin. And when a colleague said, well, why is that? Then the editorial was like, hey, this is like weapons of mass destruction. We're not going to be taken fooled again. And he's like, that didn't make any sense, uh, because why are we only deciding we're not going to be fooled on certain narratives? Uh, here's what he says about the coverage of George, George Floyd. And I think that this is really poignant. He says, you know, this began a difficult question of racism. Is America, as progressive activists claim, beset by systemic racism in the 2020s in law enforcement, education, housing, and everywhere? He said, we happen to have very powerful tools for answering these questions, journalism. Journalism lets that evidence lead the way. But instead of doing journalism after George Floyd's death, he said the message from the top was clear. America's infestation with systemic racism was declared loud and clear. It's a given. NPR's mission is to change it. Uh, but that is dishonest. And I would love to refer you now to this great book by Coleman Hughes. It's a new book called The End of Race Politics. And I will admit to you that I am showing you his picture because he's a black man. And if a black man says that race politics is deceiving us, it, it lands very differently than when a white man says it in the year 2024. I lament that, but I think it's true. Uh, Coleman, quite, uh, Coleman Hughes quite correctly writes that most of what you are told is racism is not because he looks at the data, he's reported it, NPR has not. In fact, NPR did the opposite. They led with the conclusion that we live in a racist society, whether it exists or not, and they went so far as to track race, gender, and ethnicity and all of their sources to make sure they were getting enough diversity in their reporting. <laughs> So it's nice to get a well-rounded perspective of your stories, sure, right? But if you're more worried about the sources than the actual news, you're biasing your own reporting and most likely the story too, and you're letting down your audience. So that's, that's dumb. And if, you know, I know I've reported many times how the media disproportionately would cover crimes of black people. Uh, well, they also now are disproportionately omitting crimes with white victims. And so their software should have told them that. Who programmed the software? Was it they AI? They made it. Oh, so they it, made it themselves. Again, this is like Google Gemini, right? So yeah. again, as Elon Musk points out, you know, in, uh, put crappy inputs in, you get crappy inputs out. Right. Yeah. And he says that a lot of the language that NPR reporting has been captured by interest groups um, mostly we can assume these are sort of young, straight out of college, coddled babies whose parents and university have expected very little real life out of them. So they expect to go into the newsroom and say, we need representation. We understand society better than older white people. Here, he said, is a list of all of the groups that started to form at NPR and to inform how the network would uh, cover certain yeah. things. So it's, you know, Latin X, these marginalized genders group. These are all the groups. I don't need to read them to you. You can see that would have meetings and then decide how NPR would cover things because their representation they felt was historically not good and they were going to change that. Um, and all of this, he says, leads to the absence of viewpoint diversity. 
He did try to tell his colleagues this in a meeting, and here's what happened. He basically got crickets. He looked at voter registration for the newsroom, found that there were zero Republicans working in the newsroom. He presented his findings to an all-hands staff, and he said the response was hostile. Uh, it wasn't hostile. It was worse. It was profound indifference. So these same people that are grouping up saying that they love diversity, really they love diversity if it's transgender groups or Latin groups or Jewish groups, but when it's diversity of thought, they don't love that. They don't love that at all. They're, they love closed tribes. Now he went further. He tried to schedule a meeting with the CEO and the CEO canceled the meeting on the day of the meeting and said, oh, sorry, I got busy. He told him, he's like, I would like to talk to you about this, uh, this exact thing. And he's like, sounds great. I'll get back to you. He never did. Canceled the meeting. And yet they wonder why their audience is dwindling, why they're mostly still white elites, why in only three in 10 people say they trust NPR. Uh, so what does he get for all of this? He gets a suspension. The CEO maligns him and he quits. Now, if NPR was a principled organization, they would say, huh, this is interesting. We have been doing this or have we? Can we do some soul searching? Can we be better? We're bleeding an audience here. People don't trust us. Maybe we can think about how we have allowed an entire generation of young people to push their ideology, their it's sort of inexperienced ideology from the bottom up because they're used to being coddled and we need to think about actual diversity of thought. They did not do that. They did none of that. Instead, they are now accusing him of feeding conservative narratives. Here is again NPR reporting on itself, saying that the peace in the free press angered many of his colleagues, uh, led NPR leaders to announce monthly internal reviews of the network's coverage and gave fresh ammunition to conservative and partisan Republican critics of NPR, including President, former President Trump. Now, NPR says that Berliner's article pissed off the staff because, of course, they don't want to actually address actual bias. So did they respond to his ac accus accusations about Russiagate or Hunter Biden or COVID or race? Of course they don't, because those things are inexcusable. They're not learning the lesson. They're literally punishing the messenger, uh, shooting the messenger by doing all of this stuff. And here is what they say they're going to do, which is basically what he accuse them of doing is, oh, okay, well, we have this person. She's going to now lead these monthly meetings to ask these questions each month. Did we capture the diversity of the country, racial, ethnic, religious, economic, political, geographic? Are we, did we offer coverage that helped them understand better? Like these cute little, like, you know, dumb people who listen to NPR, are we helping them understand the world better? Uh, are we having representation in the news. I mean, no one cares about representation in the news if it gets in the way of the actual news. Read the room, NPR. So are they really counting their biases? No, they're not. They're refusing to do this and they won't learn the lesson. And yes, NPR is partially funded by Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which is funded by the federal government. So we pay them to be tone deaf elites and we get nothing for it, which makes me very sad because it means that the media doesn't want to learn to be better. They think they're better than you. And when a mirror is put in front of their faces, they see nothing. They see nothing wrong. They don't see how ugly they are. Um, and they want just to produce things that make them feel superior. We saw this earlier this week when this clip went viral. This is Katie Couric talking about MAGA voters. And I feel like, to your point, Bill, the socioeconomic disparities are a lot, and class resentment is a lot what, and anti-intellectualism and elitism is what is driving many of these, these anti-establishment, which are Trump voters, right. or anti-establishment voters. So I think that is, a huge problem that we have to address. I mean, globalization and, you know, the transition from an industrial to a so, technological society. I mean, I, I 
And I don't know if you've ever been jealous of some what someone else has or resentful. It is such a corroding and um, bitter, almost bile <laughs> feeling. Right. What the hell is she talking about? Let me tell you, Clayton, because Clayton, let's let's role play. I get everything I want. Have you ever, does that happen to you or have you ever been jealous too? Um, have you ever not got what you want? I can't think of it. No, I no, can't. No, we don't, right? Because we're elitists. Two no. elitists sitting but, on a show you know, talking if about... you live in Ohio and you worked at a factory that's been shut down because of high-tech progress, you're corroded by jealousy for people like us. And, and people that's like why us, you would vote people for like, Trump. People like us that understand globalization, understand technological advances. Because you're just said. a dummy who worked in a chicken farm and you've been outsourced. You don't know any better. She you're just... anti-intellectual. So those people feel jealous. Have you ever felt jealous? No, right? No, no. we haven't felt jealous. We're here <laughs> on their own. recently get like her... Did she just recently get her like WEF silver membership card in the mail and now she's feeling it? Because <laughs> she must have, yeah. Klaus Schwab mailed it in for her. Like Katie Couric. It's You've actually, done very good. It's actually really hard to be me. I'm so smart and I always get what I want. So I never feel jealous. But those Trump people, they're just. I mean, the Not fact like there, that. There, there was so much hubris, there was so much uh, condescension in those few sentences. I mean, first of all, Looking down her nose, explaining that, like, you know, the power of globalization, why that's so powerful. That ship has sailed, as you're seeing right now with Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, globalization, you're looking at battle lines being drawn all over the world right now. Uh, that has that ship has sailed and that ship has failed. Right. So this idea that we're going to offshore all of our manufacturing, we're going to send it all to China under Bill Clinton. We're going to send it all to Mexico. Um, you know, it's it's it killed these people. Where do you think all of the MAGA movement came from? It came from you sending their jobs overseas. Mm -hmm. It's like this sort of basket of deplorables out of touch Hillary Clinton people. And Katie Couric is, sit there, is part of that. Right. And the anti-intellectualism thing is what really gets me because... She's acting as an elite who is refusing diversity of thought, which is intellectualism. She's refusing to do research about, oh, the economy, COVID, Hunter Biden, any of those things that might explain why someone might not support the Democratic Party. So she's displaying anti-intellectualism while looking down her nose at intellectuals who might actually appreciate doing research. And I would love to ask her simple questions like when President Trump um, yesterday, or was it yesterday or today, went into Harlem and they had to close down the streets because thousands of people came out to cheer him. Mm -hmm. He went, you know, he was there for his trial and they had to close down Harlem, like a number of streets, thousands of people pouring down the streets to see him um, in support of him. Like, I'm sure Barack Obama loves that. What would Katie Couric think of all of these MAGA supporters in Harlem? That coming, are anti-intellectual and jealous. Right, and coming out to show their support and care for Trump. Like, I, she, yeah. her head is probably Obviously spinning. Obviously, she'd say they don't know what's good for them. You know, right. Exactly. Kind of exactly. Rhetoric? Yes, yes. They and don't I know think what's that good for them. this is part of the, like, Hillary Clinton, Rachel Maddow playbook that if you just insult these people they'll be embarrassed and stop it right. and that doesn't work yeah all you black people why are you out there in harlem cheering on donald trump don't you know any better don't you know as democrats and here in our little You're elitist circle gauche yeah so stop it oh that's me oh okay i didn't realize that you thought that then i'm not a christian lobaton wearing you know, um, elitist. So I'll stop it and be more like you. And then maybe I'll never be jealous in my life and I'll want from nothing. Uh, so this I mean, is kind of guess it worked with Matt Lauer. We don't see him anymore. He kind of, you know, after he was embarrassed, he kind of disappeared. I guess yeah. he didn't have a choice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. After they discovered yeah. his secret door, his, his locking mechanisms to keep the women in. Right. Uh, so no, the media is not having a come to Jesus moment anytime soon they're just going to keep acting like this and then we'll just keep leaving yeah the mainstream media is officially dead uh, npr is just its latest victim and it's sad because i used to like npr back in the day before i really re you know thought that they had like some big agenda i would i like i thought it was calming i would put it on in the morning sure 
You know, I, I liked that they had an iPad app at the very beginning of like when the iPad rolled out and I liked their little interface and I could pick a few stories and make a little playlist. And it was like, I want to listen to this story about technology. I want to listen to this story about yeah. whatever. And it was it was nice. It was like pleasant. Well, well I, he I, says here that actually people, when he used to say to people, I work for NPR, they'd say, oh, I love NPR. I love this person. I love this thing, you know, and now he says it at parties and people are like, they're when like, when did that lo lose its, it's like way? A, it was like a fart in a right. And he's crust. like, it's just I don't have that response anymore because people don't respect it. Yeah, it really is. It totally well, lost it. And and I think what we're seeing with seeing with all this recent legislation and stuff is this is the desperate time where they're trying to like you know you got a social media platform saying oh we're gonna give you the most relevant news sources like cnn and all this it's just they're trying to maintain their control they're trying to grasp at everything that they have left before they completely crumble and we're seeing it right before our eyes and that's why they're coming after independent journalists because we're winning we are winning the conversation we are winning in every metric but they uh don't like that so they're coming after us yeah, but it's heartbreaking for people like Clayton and I who, you know, spent a career and educated ourselves in order to join mainstream media and, and just see, I, I liked those people. Those were my colleagues and friends. Why are they refusing to look into things? They're supposed to be journalists. Why are they refusing yeah, to look, look in the, certain corners? But look at the ones who are. Look at Megyn Kelly. Look at Tucker Carlson. Look at Don, Don, Don Bongino. The people that got out of that world and are doing it are the most popular on the Internet right now. Yeah, but that's not who just makes up the media. I'm, we're thinking of colleagues, Clayton and I, producers and camera people oh, gotcha. and things like that that just, it you know, that are breaking our hearts because we can't have a conversation with those people about any any given topic. Like, okay, you're saying this, but I'm gonna point you to this research and they just think we're crazy, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. It's, it's another world. And yeah. by the way, the sort of alternative media in that way, other than websites and blogs, really didn't exist in the way that it does. This is, I think what you're seeing here, like with our show, and again, like last night, I thanked all of you because last, last month we hit an amazing record. 25 million of you watched the show which is amazing across our platform. So thank you so much. Um, this, you couldn't, this didn't exist a few years ago. It's as a result of the, I think it's as a result of their failures, you know, as a result of their bias, as a result of their inability to cover the stories like that we covered tonight here on the show um, that were, that we even exist. If they did their jobs, we wouldn't have to do this. <laughs> Yeah, right? It turns out people can handle the truth. You know, like yeah. there's like, you can't handle the truth. We have to spoon feed you what we think you want. No, people can handle the truth and they want it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And we're seeking the truth on the show. We don't have all the answers, but we're looking for it constantly. So that's our modus operandi here on the show. So, and we have had, we've had circumstances where we covered something and then I realized, oh, there's a whole other angle to that. Let's come back at that story and we'll apologize. And, or, you know, that's what it takes in order to earn your trust. We, we shouldn't know everything, but if you get it wrong, you say, oh, how do I miss that other side? Or how can I make that up? Instead of like, oh, that's just MAGA extremists who want to hear a different side. And that's what they're doing. And that's crazy. Um, and they will answer for this in their soul review. And I don't think it's going to, you're not going to get a good grade. That's what I'm saying. You're going to get a bad grade on your soul test. Frank Rizzo says we would be in the dark without redacted. Well, thank you very much. Um, we really, really try to shine a light on these stories and uh, do do it justice for you. So uh, thank you guys so much. We couldn't do it without you guys are amazing, amazing audience, and we really appreciate it. And we have some new shirts we wanted to, we just rolled out. So Grim um, has been working on these. He's our uh, amazing graphic designer and... So over the past few days, of course, maybe we should set the stage, keep this up on the screen here. So in Canada, there was a, a member bill that was moving through the Canadian uh, Parliament, which or it was brought before uh, uh, Parliament there, which was to uh, make it illegal, right? Two years you could face in jail if you said things that were pro Fossil oil. fuel, fossil fuels, oil, yeah. natural gas, right? Because it would go against their climate agenda. So we said, well, screw you. <laughs> We're going to make some got oil t-shirts. Yeah. And uh, we did. So I'm going to, you know, you can get, if you live in America, grab an American one and, uh, and just wear it around. Just go into, just walk around your grocery stores. <laughs> it's basically a screw you to this ridiculous. And I love it. Go to your local Canada. Yeah. If you live near the border. 
<laughs> yeah, go to your local Canada, go to your local U.S. <laughs> if you want to come across the border, go to your local United States. It's very easy in the United States to come across the border. So if you just want to do that, um, please do it. Um, so, yeah, we've got we've got our new Got Oil T-shirts at our redacted store. Go and grab one. Uh, that guy's very, very happy about it. And our and our American on the left, he loves his Got Oil T-shirt. You as don't well. have to have a beard like to wear it. Jack Black. Yeah, exactly. By the way, I should mention, keep this up there, Philip. Uh, last week on Friday, the Biden administration just rolled out new regulations and fines for drilling in the United States. They're now making it so onerous for you to drill in the United States. And we are literally down to 17 days supply in our strategic oil reserves right now. This is how much Biden loves drilling for oil and natural gas. Uh, yeah. But anyway, go grab them. Also, in the middle shirts, demand government transparency. Uh, that's our new shirt in the middle there. So check that out at redactedstore.com. All of them right there. So Yeah, it's an inside joke. It will endear you to other redacted fans should you see them in the wild. So yeah, uh, yeah. If you, <laughs> if you buy one, let us know and send us a picture. So thank you so much for joining us today, Sorry. you guys. Yeah, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Oh, Philip? I was going to say, I just I just glanced over and saw in the chat somebody asked uh, why David and I sound like we're brothers. It's, yes. It's, it's because we're brothers. It might. Yeah, it might be because we are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Literal brothers. Philip and David. Foster. I showed up. I showed up at my mom's house one time and I had dyed my hair blonde and cut it short. And Philip had too. And my mom literally thought I was him for oh. a little bit. I'm like, no, I'm. I'm dead. <laughs> so we look enough alike that people have mistaken us before. That's hilarious. Yes, they are brothers. Uh, so the brothers, the brothers Foster will be back tomorrow. Um, and uh, we will be back tomorrow. 4 p.m. Eastern time is when we stream this show live. So join us, please. 4 p.m. Eastern time. Set your set your timer and we will have a great show for you tomorrow, Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern.